Hello everyone, wonderful to see you all here today. Uh, my name is Zoe and I am the product manager here at Rebus Community and we are very pleased to be welcoming you all again to this month's office hours uh, where we have a very juicy theme that we're excited to dig into um, and that is kind of building on a lot of the conversations we've been having this year with some great guests contributing. So to start, I'll hand over to Karen, uh, my lovely co-host from OTN to introduce our guests for the day. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Zoe. As always, we are delighted to partner with the Rebus community on these office hours. And as she mentioned, uh, we are excited to talk today about a provocative topic, perhaps, and that is money, paying OER contributors. So we anticipate this could be both a practical and a philosophical conversation. And we have three guests who are going to represent the state, campus, and consortial perspective. So we're fortunate to have those three different viewpoints. If you are new to office hours, our guests will talk for about five minutes, introduce themselves and their context. And then after that, we will turn things over to all of you to drive the conversation. So please be thinking about your questions and comments as you're listening to our three guests. So I am excited to welcome Karen Bakula, who is Minnesota State OER Faculty Development Coordinator, Dawn Lowe Winsonson, the Director of the Portland Metro Campus Library, and Amanda Herford, who is the Scholarly Communications Director for Palney, and Palney is the Private Academic Library Network of Indiana. So we'll hear first from Karen, then we'll turn over to Dawn and turn things over to Amanda after that, and then we'll hear from all of you. So um, take it away, please, Karen. You're muted. Okay, had to unmute there. Um, yes, my name is Karen Pakula. I teach psychology at Central Lakes College in Brainerd, Minnesota. And I am, as Karen said, also the OER Faculty Development Coordinator for Minnesota State, which is a system of 30 colleges and seven universities. First of all, I'd like to thank you for joining this conversation today and also inviting me to be able to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing at Minnesota State. We know that oftentimes faculty struggle in finding resources when they first get started with OER. And, um, to find resources that actually meet their teaching style, their learners' needs, and their course objectives is often quite a challenge for them. And they also find that often those uh, resources don't have ancillary resources with them. Often they do, um, but also um, we find that same thing with our commercial publishers. Sometimes those ancillary resources are with them and sometimes they aren't. But we do know that um, Commercial publishers make it very convenient for our faculty to go to like a one-stop shop to get all the things that they need for, um, for teaching their courses. Even though oftentimes those resources don't necessarily meet their teaching styles, their course objectives, or their learners' needs. So today I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about my experience, both at an institutional and a system level, about how we have worked um, to show faculty um, appreciation for the hard work they do when they first start to um, review, adopt, and create um, open educational resources. So what happened at Minnesota State is they uh, originally offered grants uh, system-wide to institutions to apply um, to do um, work in, in an open educational uh, resource arena. And um, that's what happened at our college. We applied for one of those grants. Um, a part of that grant was a learning circle process that I had written um, to guide faculty through um, review, adoption, and creation of open educational resources. Um, as a result of that grant, we were able to um, run the learning circles. I ran them um, with a librarian. We always um, ran our, our learning circles and. Um, with a librarian at the inst uh, institutional level. At the system level, I try to uh, work with faculty working with their librarians at their institutions. And the reason I say that is because I, I think it's so important to understand what a key uh, factor in successful OER initiatives, um, uh, what a key factor librarians are in those initiatives. Um, so because of that grant, we were able to pay faculty stipends 
um, for attending those learning circles. And a typical stipend um, at Central Lakes was like $500 to do a review of a textbook. And they were, those folks typically were done with a review in five weeks. Our learning circles for course redesign and authoring of materials typically run 10 weeks. And faculty in those, um, those pathways um, would get around $1,500 stipend for doing that. That being said, we totally 100% recognize that we cannot compensate faculty um, in terms of the time invested for the hard work that they do, but we approach it both at the institutional system level from the perspective of showing them appreciation for the hard work that we do, they are doing. And I think um, research shows, and, and certainly the research that I have done um, working with, um, with um, novice teachers, shows that the two of the big um, time fact are factors or barriers to faculty in course redesign, whether it's OER or other work, is time and also support and appreciation. So Minnesota State saw that um, this was really quite effective at the, um, at the institutional level, and so they hired me to scale that up to a system-wide learning circle approach. And that's the model that we currently use at the system as well. Um, it has been very effective. The learning circles run for 10 weeks and faculty redesign courses and author and create ancillary materials and also textbooks. A typical stipend that we pay them um, is also around, well, for the first learning circles, we were able to pay them about one release credit equivalency, which can, depending on job um, description, institution, uh, tenure, can run usually somewhere between three or $4,000 a credit. This last learning circle, we've had to cut that down to a half a credit just because of funding from the legislation. But that's typically what we pay. And we do do those as interagency agreements or release credits. I have to say that that in our in Minnesota is a very complicated um, process because we deal with several unions. Um, but and at first it was very um, it was very challenging to do. But this is our fourth um, session of running those learning circles, and I have to say that we've really refined that process down. It's become quite effective and quite efficient. And um, that being said, you know, there's that, that is the downside is that it's challenging, but the upside of it is, uh, is it's well invested work because um, we are truly being able to save our students money. We're being able to offer our faculty professional development opportunities where we really see them take ownership back for their own expertise and as being experts in their field and recognizing and really kind of flourishing under that new found um, confidence in their um, in their field of expertise. And I think I'm just about out of time. I just wanted to mention that Jenny Parks um, was also supposed to be here. She has done a study, a faculty study that she has gathered some da data that I think Karen can share or I could share some later if anyone's interested that she will also be posting to the listserv soon. So thank you. Thanks, Karen, and thanks for that reminder. I'll find the link that Jenny um, wanted to share. Um, now I would like to turn things over to Dawn. Hi, I am Dawn Lobin Swenson. I'm the Portland Metro Campus Librarian for Oregon Institute of Technology. The main campus is down in Klamath Falls, um, which is the southern end of Oregon. Portland is the northern end of Oregon. Um, and I see, thankfully, Amy Hopper, who is our statewide uh, open education coordinator, is on the line. So she can maybe correct me when I go astray with some of the coordination that we've done with the state. Um, from 2017 to earlier this year, I was the interim director of libraries for all of Oregon Tech. Um, the role gave me access to the resources and people I needed to create an open education program at the university. Uh, and while I'm not in that role anymore, I have a very supportive university librarian, uh, John Schopert, who is very much um, willing to continue what we've been doing. 
So in 2017, I attended a presentation at ACRL Washington, which is a regional ACRL um, conference, and was so inspired um, by a presentation to create an internal um, organ tech program to support open educational resources in the sciences and engineering. So upper division, um, a lot of things that weren't being covered elsewhere, or at least that was the aim. Uh, in the meantime, we found additional ways to support the movement, including funds from Open Oregon Educational Resources. Um, there were review workshops, or one work review workshop in the first year, and a couple of other options. Um, we had some people that applied for and received funding directly from Open Education Resources, and some that received funding through Oregon Tech from Open Education Resources. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we have figured out to get money to help support faculty in this way. So when it came time to pay people from the internal grants in 2018, we had brought in three different programs that all had to go through different processes to fund people. So I created a flowchart. And I'm not sure if you have the option to share that flowchart or if you want me to um, post the link. You should be able to share your screen. There's a big green button right in the center if you wanted to do that. Or you could always drop in a link in the chat. Okay. Yep, we can see it. So this is the flowchart that I created at the time. Um, so this was 2018, the first year of the program. The first flowchart on here is the internal grant process. Um, and I was the library budget authority. There were multiple different budgets uh, that I was dealing with. So I pulled $10,000 out of one budget to pay people. Uh, and then a committee was formed. We received 14 applications. We reviewed and decided to fund all of them because we were so excited that people wanted to do this. Um, they had to sign and return contracts. And then some sort of magic happened in the provost office that is not on this flowchart. But payroll paid them at, on June 30th of that year, so the last day of the fiscal year. Um, and then a committee was formed again in the fall to do this again the following year. There were OER review stipends. So these are $200 stipends um, through Open Educational Resources. Uh, to encourage people to review things. And Amy Hoffer will come to one of the Oregon universities and provide a workshop. She's also taught us how to provide our own workshops. Uh, so you go to a workshop, you review. We had eight people attend that first year and only four of them completed reviews. And then there was some sort of magic that happened. Again, I'm not sure if it was the business office or the provost office, somewhere around there. and we paid the people directly and then invoiced um, Amy Hoffer's university for refunding or reimbursement. And then there is the open educational grants um, from the state, which are external, even though they're still from open educational resources, they are, or open organ educational resources. Um, they are external to the internal processes and they don't have to be reimbursed. They are just paid directly through our grants office. So I had to create all three of these different flowcharts. And then as we added programs in the following year, by the end of 2019, there were five different ways that people could be paid. And through leadership changes, business office changes, monetary changes, in addition to the new ways that people could be paid, um, there are even more changes coming for the next time. So like I said, John Schobert, our university librarian, is very supportive of the program and he wants to continue it. He has dedicated another $10,000 this year. We paid another $10,000 last year. Um, so we will find a way, but it's a little exciting. Thank you, Dawn. It's always nice when magic works in your favor, which it sounds like it did in these cases. Magic happened and, and what needed to happen, happened. Okay, Absolutely. now we are going to turn things over to Amanda. Great. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Amanda Herford. 
and I am the Scholarly Communications Director for the Poundley Consortium, as was mentioned. And along with my colleague, Erin Milanese, who's the Affordable Learning Coordinator at Poundley, we manage our consortial program we call PAL Save. Um, that's the name of our, kind of our branded name of our program across the consortium. So a little bit of a background about Poundley. So Poundley is a 501c3 um, that is owned by the 24 supported institutions that we work with. Um, so as a private entity, we are likely facing less regulations than other environments might be facing. Um, but I'm happy to kind of give you kind of a practical overview on how we process payments from this central consortial level. Um, so when we joined the Open Textbook Network back in 2018, we started paying faculty incentives to review open textbooks as part of the workshops that we offered as OTN system leaders across the 24 institutions that we support. So those funds were paid out centrally at the consortial level, um, and we quickly spent down our first budgeted $5,000 on those payments, and we, um, we went back to the board and asked for another $5,000 that we could use to fund those payments. And thankfully, um, we were given that extra $5,000, but we quickly spent all of that as well. So we had spent about $10,000 paying um, for faculty to review books in the Open Textbook Library. And we just continued to have really wide interest in this program. So thankfully, um, we applied for and received a grant from the Lilly Endowment in 2019 to continue paying reviewers at the same um, rate that we had been, and also to provide future stipends for adoption, adaptation, and creation of OER for the next five years of our program. So we're very lucky that we have that funding. So, so far we've delivered 16 workshops to our supported institutions and processed or are in the, um, the process of processing <laughs> payments for 73 reviews. Um, so a little bit more about our workflow for paying those. Um, our workflow includes Aaron, um, and it used to be me who did all of this, but now Aaron um, has come on and is doing a lot of these things. So she consults the Open Textbook Network data dashboard in order to determine um, when a review has been completed. And she looks at the review and makes sure that it's complete and looks good and everything like that. Of course, not making any changes, but just kind of checking off for ourselves that the review was actually done. And she then emails the faculty member um, to thank them for their review and then also to collect their address for payment. And then next, she emails the name and address of the payee to our executive director, Kirsten Leonard, who has to enter that information into our bill payment system using something called bill.com. It's the way that we um, enter those, um, those names and addresses. And then the payment is approved by the Pownley treasurer and automatically um, creates a check and is mailed through the bill.com system. So Erin sends these messages to our executive director weekly um, and tries to bulk them together as much as possible so that she's not pinging Kirsten every single time a new review comes in. We found that to be a good way to do it about weekly. And then once the check is mailed, we mark the review as paid in the data dashboard. And um, one thing that we do on our end is we maintain a somewhat complicated spreadsheet. Um, I really love spread spreadsheets, I'm a spreadsheet person. Um, and it, this spreadsheet is kind of a mixture of the data dashboard data that we've downloaded from the dashboard, merged with local data that we collect, such as addresses um, and you know what, what the rating was that the faculty member had given to the book so that we can uh, maintain those stats on our end. Um, and we also track on this master spreadsheet dates for when some of the workflow steps have been completed, such as when the address was collected or when the payment was sent to our executive director. So we've got like one big spreadsheet that um, really governs the whole process. So that would be the one big piece of advice that I have um, if you're a spreadsheet person like me, even if you're not, is to track all of these payments in one place. And if you are a part of the Open Textbook Network and you have access to the data dashboard, to use that data provided as a good starting place. So we're constantly downloading the um, data from the dashboard and plugging it into our spreadsheet so that we have the most up-to-date data there. So setting up our workflow has been sort of an iterative process. Our current system seems to be working really well. 
Um, but before we used bill.com, our director was having to print and sign and physically mail all of the checks to the faculty, which was um, a manual and laborious process. Um, so um, a, new, a new thing that we've been doing is over the summer, we piloted our first round of, of adoption stipends, um, where we've paid more than the $200 that we were paying for the reviews. Um, so we're now paying amounts of $1,000 to adopt. And we also had one person adapt, um, where, and we paid that person $2,000. So um, we asked that they um, adopt or adapt the book and also provide feedback to our group in order to inform future work. So um, both for adopting the resource and providing that feedback, we, um, we provided payment after that work was completed. So as an additional step for those bigger amounts, Palney will be issuing 1099 tax forms to those faculty for the larger amounts in January. And this means that we had to figure out a way to securely gather their social security numbers for those participants, which was a bit of a weird wrinkle um, that we had to you know, call them and keep a record of those social security numbers without you know, emailing it or making that information um, unsecure in some way. So as far as um, steps for the future, we're looking forward to figuring out further ways to streamline our process, such as using a form um, that bill.com can read instead of having to manually enter that data. Uh, we also look forward to continuing to offer larger stipends for more complex works like um, more adaptation projects or creating open textbooks, um, which of course will present its own challenges as we defined our our publishing workflow. So we're enrolled in Pub 101 right now. So we're learning all about um, all the different payments that we're going to have to make and how to manage the different um, contributors to that process. So I hope this was helpful in um, providing the consortial perspective. Thanks very much, Amanda. And thanks again, Don and Karen. So Annie had a couple great questions in the chat. But before I pose those uh, to our guests, I would just like to invite all of you to share any stories you may have in your context and also think about what direction you would like to take our conversation. So we've heard about uh, money as a way to show appreciation, not necessarily as payment for time. Um, we've heard about challenges dealing with different um, unions and their, their rules. Um, framing things, being able to buy out faculty release time was something else that was mentioned. Um, magic was mentioned, which may be, you know, ideal uh, whenever possible in terms of, you know, working with people maybe in other parts of the organization who can, who can make it happen and that it's not actually you who has to figure it out um, all the way from start to finish. Um, and we could also talk about uh, timing payment with deliverable, <laughs> deliverables, especially uh, when it comes to um, adaptation and creation projects. So, Please get your wheels turning and think about um, what you would like to explore with one another in the half an hour or so that we have left. And now, um, Annie had a question. I think this was directed at you, Karen. Was the five hundred dollars that you paid for a peer review of a was it for a peer review of a textbook manuscript? In other words, sort of pre-publication process, or was that five hundred dollars for a finished? textbook, in other words, an o OTL review or some other completed work? It was for uh, a completed work. And at the institutional level is where we paid the $500 when we were managing the funds from our the grant that we had received. At the system level, now when um, we just kind of stick, um, we've moved from having that three pathways to two pathways, which is course redesign authoring of ancillary materials or authoring of textbooks. So we also utilize the OTN um, book re reviews from the webinars as some of the others do it as a way of, of having faculty review textbooks. But that was not for manuscripts. I, I, that was for uh, completed textbooks. Thanks, Karen. I know a lot of um, programs will aim for $200 for a review as well. Um, and that without that incentive, usually the review rates drop off significantly. Um, Annie had an, a question for Amanda. The $2,000 for adapting, were there any strings attached? Like, could they just change a few things or did you kind of define what sort of 
major edits or additions needed to be made? That's a great question. Really hard to kind of get in there and, and quantify. So when we put out our call for participants in this pilot program, it was actually just for adopting an open textbook. Um, and we knew that we wanted to pay $1,000 for that adoption stipend. And one of the applications that we got was someone who said, I would like to remix an open textbook um, using lots of different open resources. Um, can I participate? And of course we said, yes, you can participate. And we talked amongst our group and decided that it would make more sense to offer this person an increased stipend because of the amount of work that was gonna be involved in what they were doing. And also to, um, consult with them to find out what are some of the implications of remixing an open textbook. Um, so we're kind of at the beginning phase of our project where we're planning to create an RFP for, um, you know, who wants to do adapting open textbooks in the future. So we figured that it made sense to offer this person $2,000 as for the work that they were doing and then also to consult with us on all of the implications of what we would need to do in the future. So whether or not we will continue to offer $2,000 for that stipend or what kind of strings will be attached is kind of to be determined. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something to think about. Yeah, and it could be handy to have um, a project charter, uh, which was introduced uh, in Pub 101 yesterday, or some other way to sit down with the author and you know, look at what they've proposed, either in response to a call for proposals or another conversation, so that there's a map that you're both sort of looking at and understanding in terms of, oh, these are the changes you're going to make, or okay, you're, you're changing out these five chapters, or, um, you know, trying to get a handle on, you know, what's on the table. Uh, sometimes it's easier said than done. Sophie has a question for you also, Amanda. Is there an RFP process for the adopt-adapt stipends? So far, we do not have one, but we're going to be um, implementing that here in the near future. And we're in the process of kind of looking at how others have done that um, before we put out our, our call for our next participants. So we just finished up our pilot and um, we'll definitely have a more formal process going forward. I think during this initial phase, we, we let folks know who had attended a, um, a workshop through the Palisade program that you know, we are doing this pilot. Is anyone interested? Is anyone ready to adopt an open textbook? You know, come aboard with us and um, help us define this process. So we'll definitely have an RFP um, in the future. Thanks, Amanda. Sarah uh, has a question for any of our three guests or anyone else in the call. Um, she's looking for advice on a stipend amount for a faculty member who reviewed an OER textbook draft authored by a fellow faculty member. Um, Amy said that she usually pays $200 for a post-publication review, and Annie says they've been paying $150 for a peer review of a textbook draft. Um, any other numbers out there or processes people would like to share about paying, um, paying reviews? Uh, a colleague has written a book and someone else is going to review it for that colleague, that sort of arrangement. Is that one of your um, five ways, Don? You mentioned five ways people get paid. That is, and it's the $200 that Amy mentioned. Thanks. We've also worked with a project who had a grant um, where they were able to, so they were the, the faculty lead on the project. They were able to uh, pay a small stipend to peer reviewers um, from them through the grant that they received. And I believe it was in a similar range of say two to $300. Uh, and out of that case, I also kind of wanted to raise, I think, um, to go back to a point I think Karen made initially about it, you know, being a gesture to be able to provide some kind of a stipend. On the first grant, so this, uh, this project was fortunate enough to receive two. On the first one, they were trying to structure it so they could pay something to authors. They were working on quite a broken down approach so every there was an author for each section of the book and when they took i think they had a two thousand dollar initial grant if they were breaking it down to pay people by section it was kind of in the range of 20 to maybe 50 dollars 
per section per author. And at that point, we had to have the really difficult discussion of, uh, you know, is that, is that worth it? Is that enough of an incentive for people to join on? And also then, you know, as has been discussed really clearly here, then the logistics of actually distributing, you know, $120 payments or, or whatever it would work out to be, um, they ended up deciding to retain that, uh, that funding for other purposes. So I think they put some into design, some into editing. And then, as I say, once they got the second grant to kind of top up the first, they, they uh, put that into paying reviewers. Um, and so, yeah, I'm interested as well if people have uh, author payment kind of numbers to, to throw around in a similar vein as these review numbers that we're sharing. Something that Zoe just touched on was um, the amount that authors actually walk away with. The way that our payroll office makes us do this is we, the library then covers the other operational expenses. Um, same with Amy's office. When we invoice her, we invoice her for those on top of the payment. So the faculty member walks away with the $200 um, and then the university is reimbursed for those other operational expenses, which include the taxes on it. That's a great point. A lot of times um, it might be $200 uh, in, in theory only, and by the time you get the payment, it's um, quite a bit less. Speaking of money, Jonathan mentioned that he was offered $400 by a commercial publisher to review a single chapter of an upcoming book. Jonathan, I guess I won't ask if you decided to do it or not. I'll just leave that. <laughs> All right, Rachel's wondering if anyone has suggested resources for locating grants for funding OER projects. Oh no, Jonathan did say he did the work, but he didn't get paid. That's the worst case scenario. Um, Amanda, I think you mentioned the name of a granting institution. Is that unique to your location or your consortium? Yeah, we, so we um, applied for a grant through the Lilly Endowment, which I believe is um, an, a granting institution only within the state of Indiana. Thanks. This is a question that I think comes up, if not every office hours, in many office hours, because I know everybody's looking for funding and it's hard to find. Um, mostly it's at that state or consortial level. Um, and if it's not coming from there, it's pretty hard to, to find, I think, elsewhere. But if anyone knows of suggestions or locations where the money may be, please do share. Uh, I have a couple of suggestions um, because our budgets have been severely cut this year. Um, we are trying to be creative in different ways. So the beginning of the month, um, I put in, along with an engineering faculty, an NSF grant to look at open pedagogy and electrical engineering um, that does include things like a subscription to um, press books so that we could create our own materials. Um, another thing that we have done is our president of the university um, and the head of the board were talking about textbook affordability and um, tossed my name out there amazingly, uh, also pronounced it correct, uh, during a university-wide um, session. And I was approached by the board of the foundation after that to put together a list of things that we needed. So I have a one sheet um, that I'm happy to share that gives a visual of different ways that people can fund that our foundation is now going out and asking people for, um, and that we've used for our associated student uh, bodies at the various or, or at the various campuses to also ask them to contribute. So I will go ahead and add a link to that. Yes, please do. Thank you, Don. I was just going to say, Don, please share. I know everyone would appreciate it. I'd just like to say too, um, you know, even though it's a small amount or depending on the institution, it can be a small amount. But when we wrote our first grant for, um, for our system office that we got at Central Lakes, a piece of that that they wanted in there was a sustainability piece. 
So at that time I went to our VP and I asked them, I, we were spending a ton of money um, for our PSEO students textbooks. And as a result of um, the OER work at our institution, we have been able to save a lot of money um, using open educational resources versus commercial textbooks for our PSEO students. So at that time, I asked our um, VP if they would commit if we saved money to um, re putting, returning some of that money back into our OER program at Central Lakes and funding future OER work through those savings to the institution. So that's something that you might think about at your own individual institutions or even um, at the system level. If there's ways that you can see that um, you're actually saving the system or your institution some funds to see if they would reintroduce those back, um, even a percentage of them, they give us just a percentage back in to continue our OER work. Awesome, thank you, Karen, for raising that. Uh, I have a, an idea to share as well. Uh, we've been talking a lot with Concordia University who are based here in Montreal, and they are currently in their first year of kind of very dedicated OER work. They hired an OER librarian on a 12 month contract. They have funded their first four projects, I believe. And the bulk of the funding for this kind of OER pilot dedicated time has come through the student, uh, student organizations on campus and the student government. So they have such a structure, I don't know all the ins and outs, but they had a chunk of funding to allocate on behalf of students and, and they worked with the library to get dedicated to funding OER creation and, and adoptions on campus, which I thought was a really, really exciting approach um, and is already having huge impact there. Fantastic. Alexis had a question for Dawn, but I think it could be for any of you who just shared um, just sort of reflecting on why support is so high uh, for the Oregon State mandate or for OER textbook affordability. You know, if the support was always there or if it grew over time, Amy made a great comment in the chat that a lot of it is due to um, the groundwork that Don laid and others, I'm sure, in Oregon. So um, it would be great to hear thoughts on, you know, funding and how it's evolved over time. So what I put in the chat is that it has grown over time. Uh, it really was, I was inspired at a presentation and I went back to the library and I said, we're doing this. And they all looked at me as if I had sprouted a second head. Um, and in September, our university librarian said, no, we are going to continue this and we are going to put effort into this because there is a buzz about the university on this now. And they all looked at him as if he had sprouted a second head and I had grown horns for both of my heads. Um, so it sounds like there's an amazing amount of support, but there's only 16 faculty that have gone through this program directly. There are others that say that they are using this and I'm trying to collect um, that data as to others that are supporting open educational resources. Um, we are still taking library money to do it. Uh, it's not directly tied to, I mean, our library money is directly tied to student tuition, um, but not really in the way that the university funds the library. So I hope that answers another question down there. But it's been years in the making to get this, and certainly having the support of the state is a huge part of that. Dawn, as an aside, I just want to say how much I appreciate the fantastical environment in which you work, where people sprout multiple heads horns and magic is happening. <laughs> Sounds bad. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Pegasus is fly along with the owls <laughs> with our mascot. Fantastic. Um, if there are other thoughts on that, uh, please chime in. Meanwhile, it looks in the chat that there's um, some conversation about, you know, whether or not student funding of OER initiatives is the right way to go. Um, so I invite um, us to sort of bring that from the chat into into a conversation if you would like. I will pause for that to happen. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we have in the last two weeks gone to our associated student bodies um, with the same sheet that I've shared you. And we gave them a presentation about what is going on what you don't see on the sheet is that the presentation we gave them focused on things that they could do that didn't involve using basically club money 
to support faculty in doing this. We asked them to be part of a textbook affordability team that would write a report for the state a house bill is requiring us all to do textbook affordability plans for the universities. Um, we asked them to go talk to their faculty and have their faculty switch to open educational resources. Uh, we asked them to go to other students and talk to other students about the benefits of talking to their faculty about doing this. So it was more an informational com campaign. We did include the money because they are groups of students that have university money to support projects to help students. Um, but we didn't necessarily want them to fund stipends to faculty. We wanted them to talk to the faculty more. Thanks, Don. Annie, Amy, Zoe, any of you care to expand? Yeah, I can uh, restate. I think that's a really, really valid question that Annie brought up, and, and it's something I would actually love to hear more from the team at Concordia about how that's working for them. I'm mentally noting, noting that um, for maybe a future session. And I think in particular, the, the goal is to prove the value to the institution so that they see that it's something they should be backing. Um, so it's, you know, it's a stepping stone to get to where they want to go. It's given them the room to, to really start establishing a program and demonstrating value very quickly, um, you know, which means that their focus is on, on funding adoptions uh, and adaptations. They do have some creation projects too, but yeah, they, I think it's a, you know, um, it's uh, that's actually probably one of the best responses to that question of, okay, where do we find money <laughs> that we've had? Um, so I wanted to toss it in the ring as another idea for those who, in the context, it does make sense to, to approach that. And I also love what, um, what's been said about other ways to leverage student support too. Yeah, sometimes it's about proof of concept and however you can get there. And this is Amy. Um, I'll just say that my brand new supervisor, before she was an administrator, she's, um, her discipline is, um, she's an economist. And it's so great to be able to talk to her about this stuff because um, I do not have that background. And every time I start trying to think or write about the economics of this, I wonder like, do I even know enough to know if I <laughs> know what I'm talking about at all? And um, I think that you know part of it is the um, money that we need to support the programs, and then there's also um, replacing or trying to figure out what to do about the revenue that um, you know we say goodbye to bookstore revenue when we stop getting profit from expensive textbooks, and that's not a sustainable revenue source. Of course, you know we're not saying that we should go back to that model, but um, you know how, providing course materials to students is an essential service along the lines of advising or having chairs in the classroom, you know? Um, so how do we continue to do that without the revenue that we previously had that was supporting that function? So anyway, these are kind of just the things that I've been trying to mull over. So um, Annie, I really appreciate the question of like, well, where should, where should the funding come from? Like, is there, do our values tell us something about where we should be looking or not looking? And I think it's a really interesting open question. Thanks. I think there's something in that approach to having, you know, an economist's eye on it. I think, I feel like one of the big pieces of information we're missing is a real understanding of the costs of creation in particular um, and, and how much, you know, time goes into it. Uh, the only kind of uh, parallel I can think of, which is, you know, doesn't fit immediately here, but there's a great study done by Ithaca about uh, monograph publishing. And it was uh, getting, you know, from acquisitions through to the point of releasing just a digital version of a, of a book was in the range of fifty dollars to $120,000. Um, so that's obviously a very traditional publishing process, which is not what most of us undertake with an OER. But having that kind of data too, I think is is you know, we're talking in the one, two, three thousand dollars for a lot of work that people are putting in. Um, and there are certainly other approaches to figuring out these questions that I think would would ask, okay, what are the actual costs and, and how are we meeting them? Um, and it's a little bit of a, I think I've said this on one of these sessions before, it always feels a little, um, a little risky kind of to be 
funding work without having that understanding and without you know fully um, compensating the work and the time that is put in um, by a lot of the people undertaking this work you know from adaptation right through to uh, to full creation from scratch and I think it, at every level there is work being done um, that is really important that we keep in focus um, and keep thinking about how to fund it and how to how to fund it adequately as well. Karen, I just was wondering if I could make a quick comment on that too in, in terms of how important student voices are actually and to understand that student voice um, is often what is really driving the OER movements especially in Minnesota. I know that all of our system grants are really funded by our legislature and those funds are coming from our legislature only because of student voices. And then the other thing um, I, I, I think of often when we're talking about uh, the economic piece of this is that while these resources are free to our students in terms of use in their courses, they really are not free re resources because the sustainability um, issue of keeping these resources up to date, the creation of them, whatever, um, is always there. But I also see this, I see in this, the time that I've been working with OER, I really truly see a heart or value change um, in the folks that do this. And I, and I see this in my positive psych course that I teach. They can take all the psychology courses in the world, but when they get into that positive psych course, it's a life-changing event for every student in there because their total value system changes and becomes so different when we're talking about sharing and being grateful and, and whatever. And, and I really see this as a whole paradigm shift in education. And I really think there's no way but for folks to experience it and get involved in the OER work in the OER community, to really have that value change within in each of us individually, to want to open up and to share and um, do work without being paid for it, for the very value of meaningfulness in our life, that mindfulness um, mindset, that um, that we're we're kind of paying it forward to a future generation. They're truly. I see, I see a value change in almost everyone that works in this. And it's something, you, it's hard to talk about. It's something that is kind of hard to sell because it's something you almost have to experience. But I truly believe it is there and it's gaining momentum. Um, I'd like to um, make a comment. Can you folks hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. I didn't test my microphone. Um, in, in Hawaii, and I'm not speaking for everybody um, who you see um, representing OER from Hawaii, but uh, my personal observation is um, we were working with our student organizations across many campuses. We have 10 campuses here and um, uh, getting a lot of support from them. Um, and the um, uh, overall organization of student congresses um, I put out a statement supporting OER um, then they had a conversation with our senators, um, and the senator, uh, the senator for higher education, I think, in I'm going to say the um, House of uh, um, the Representatives, um, basically um, started. No, actually, it was a Senate bill. I'm sorry, it was a Senate bill um, trying to basically trying to say all faculty need to start producing OER, and um, as that we were alerted to that draft. Um, so was our faculty union, and it turned into um, a pretty big mess. So it just, just a word of caution, um, the students were doing, you know, what they thought was the right thing, and they brought it up to the legislators. The legislators, and we've, we've had a history of a difficult relationship between our public uh, university system and um, our legislature, they turned around and um, wrote legislation that kind of made it a little punitive in sounding, and our faculty union got involved. There was, you know, there was there was a big mess, uh, and faculty senates too. So we've kind of had to back off on that a little bit because it just kind of um, it got out of hand. Um, it did get a little national press, so some of you may have heard that. So we're still trying to um, figure our way out through that one. Thank you, Sunny. 
Now, um, we have just a few minutes remaining, and I know that Dan Alasso is on the call, and he's a faculty member who participated in the learning circles that Karen mentioned at the top of the hour. And Dan, I think you wanted to comment on those learning circles and perhaps um, speak firsthand to how the, um, the monetary show of appreciation uh, worked for you. Your yeah, thanks. Um, I and I was just I was just thinking I just posted a little thing on the thread. Um, I don't disagree with what Karen was talking about about the about the sort of the gift economy element of this, but I do find that a lot you know that it seems when I go to conferences and whatnot, a lot of the people who are doing this are you know contingent faculty or early career faculty who are looking to you know we're looking to make a name for ourselves and um, and that that. Uh, sometimes tends to lead to administrators saying, hey, put this in your professional development report. You know, that'd be great. Um, now, on the, on the learning circles, yeah, I was in Karen's learning circles twice. And then I did, uh, she also runs a learning circle uh, leader training, which I did. Um, and she's, since then, she's sort of been on me to try to get this going on my campus because part of the agreement that my administration um, agreed to when they they signed on the line to let me do that was that they would uh, support me in in getting learning circles going on my own campus. Um, so far, I found that uh, most of the funding and most of the grant opportunities seem to be at a system level rather than at a campus level. Um, and uh, and so I think that that's that's kind of an interesting political issue because you know right now I'm I'm in uh, I'm in the for the third time I'm in Karen's. Uh, learning circle. This time I'm leading a, a group of other faculty from other campuses uh, in doing kind of a, a, um, a system-wide uh, modern world history textbook. And, uh, and I am going to put in for a grant to sort of expand that out, bring in more, um, more faculty to contribute and people from the two-year schools as well as the four-year. Um, that will be money that I'll be looking to, um, I think, to the state system for because it's not really as um, as forthcoming um, on the campus level, and the the political element that fascinates me is, you know, if we're developing these transfer pathways from two year schools to four year, if we're developing this sort of more um, more consciously um, standardized format for courses that are widely taught, um, does that shift some of the authority over those things to the state system rather than to the individual campuses and what are the implications for things like academic freedom and faculty, you know, satisfaction with the process and all that. Yeah, thanks, Dan. There are a lot of questions here and in our hour together, I feel like we've moved from sort of the practical to the philosophical and the tactical. There are a lot of angles to this question of funding and payment and where it should come from and how it is done and of course um, through the process we bump into other systems uh, in higher ed or state and federal government systems or funding systems and so there's often a lot to navigate. Um, we have five minutes remaining so if you have any burning questions now is the time to uh, post them in the chat or unmute and ask our guests. If not, I will start speaking more slowly and transition to our farewell. In the, if somebody wants to, to fill the silence in the chat, please go ahead. But I will take this last moment to say a huge thank you to everybody for contributing today. This has been a really wonderful discussion. Um, I will encourage you to keep an eye out on both of our Twitter feeds. Uh, we are at, at Rebus Community. Uh, open OTN is at open underscore textbooks. There we'll be sharing details of our next session, which uh, is actually nicely connected to some of what Dan was saying, where we're talking about tenure and promotion guidelines, promotion guidelines and OER. Um, so that's uh, sounding like it's going to shape up to be another very good discussion. 
Uh, and I'll also just uh, share a brief reminder that we are sharing, uh, we are hosting some information sessions uh, coming up on November 6th for our textbook success program. Um, if you're interested in more information about that, I just dropped a link in the chat. And um, so we'd very much look forward to seeing some of you there and, and talking more about how this work gets done, both through, uh, through our next office hours and through Twitter and all the different ways that we talk to each other um, that are all thoroughly enjoyable. So thank you everybody uh, and thank you to Karen for, uh, for co-hosting with us today. Thank you Zoe and Rebus community and thank you Karen Pakula, Don Lowe Winstonson and Amanda Herford for sharing your stories and thanks to all of you for joining us and engaging in this conversation. So look forward to next month. If we see you in Phoenix before then, uh, please say yeah. hello. Um, I will be there. I know Zoe and Aperva will be there and many of you will be there. So until we meet again, either online or in person. Thank you. Thanks everyone.